Today I've come to Stevenage in Hertfordshire to explore one of the most ancient Christian denominations in the world, the Coptic Orthodox Church. Welcome to Songs of Praise. Coming up in today's programme, the Coptic Orthodox Archbishop of London tells me about his church's ancient roots in Egypt and their unique traditions, including how they choose their Pope. We have a child who's blindfolded and will actually choose the name of the person who's to become the next Pope. I meet a young artist who explains the deep spiritual significance of icons. If we saw as Christ saw us, we'd always see the Holy Spirit literally filling us with light. And Laura Wright talks to classical and crossover stars the Ayub sisters about growing up in the Coptic Orthodox Church before they perform a beautiful arrangement of an Arabic hymn. As we explore one of the most ancient strands in the rich tapestry of the Christian church, our music today celebrates those timeless truths that bind us together as the worldwide family of God. And we begin in St. Asaph. The word Coptic means Egyptian, and the Coptic Orthodox Church is the largest Christian denomination in Egypt, with about 15 million followers, making up nearly a sixth of the country's population. But there are well over a million Coptic Christians living outside of Egypt, including a large and thriving group here in the UK. Archbishop Angelus has served that growing group for 20 years and oversaw the building of St George's, their first cathedral, inaugurated in 2006. Oh, I didn't expect to see this in a, in a corner of Hertfordshire. Tell me, where does the Coptic church fit into the worldwide church? So we're very blessed to have this wonderful oasis here. Um, nature teaches us so much. So if you look at a tree, you have a, a common origin and then branches coming from it. As Christians, we all know a common origin of humanity is creation, or even in the incarnation of Christ, the Word. And then from that, we have the major branches of the three major strands of the Christian family, Orthodoxy, Catholicism, and then the post-Reformation family. And that whatever differences there are, we all come back to this common origin that still holds us very much together. In the first centuries following Jesus' death, there were theological differences in the church, mainly about the divine and human nature of Christ. This led to orthodoxy becoming distinct and to differences within the orthodox church itself. Today, the two main branches are the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox, the second of which contains the Coptic Church. Christianity has been in Egypt for the past 2,000 years, so the writer of the second gospel, St. Mark, was the one who brought Christianity into Egypt in the middle of the first century. If we can talk about monasticism, I'm right in saying the Coptic Church is where monks first came to be? Yes, in the third century, with the establishment of monasticism under the great Saint Anthony. And for us, it's not just historic. I am a monk. Um, I come from a monastic community in Egypt that is 200 strong. I feel an instant connection if I'm walking down the street or I'm at an airport and I see a nun or a brother or a monk because I feel that we have that common connection back in the deserts of Egypt. The Coptic Orthodox Church also has a Pope. Viewed as the spiritual successor to St. Mark in Alexandria, each new Pope is chosen through a complex selection process with a unique conclusion. In the belief that the final choice is guided by the Holy Spirit, a child picks out the name from the final three candidates. People will say, oh, a child chooses the Pope, and they forget the very intricate, the month-long process that has gone on. What would you say is unique about the Coptic Orthodox Church? 
the unique experience we've had is of a church having to live through what was very often incredibly hostile persecution. And yet we're still here. We've never taken up arms, we've never been violent, and yet we're still here to tell the tale. And I think that's taught us a lot about how to live as Christians and carry a cross. What we also can't do, however, is just ignore the fact that there are differences within the family of, of Christianity. Yes, our cultures make us different, the way we dress, the way we pray, the way we chant, the way we view the sacraments. But we have so much as Christians that, that bring us together. We believe that God created the world. We believe that God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that God in flesh was Jesus Christ, who came as Savior of the world. We believe that He was crucified and that He rose victoriously, ascended, and He waits for us. And I think that is what joins us together as Christians. Icons are one of the most recognizable features of Orthodox places of worship. 35-year-old Fadi Mikhail is a full-time iconographer whose works can be seen in churches and cathedrals across the world. And the icons here in St George's are all his work. Where did your love of iconography come from? We had icons all the way around our house when I was growing up. And I think something changed around age 18. I, 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 I wanted to try and paint about my faith. And um, I had the opportunity to go for a few months to America where there was a, a Coptic iconographer working on a church. And it was a magnificent building. And I could see watching him just solidly for two months. He, he loved the materials as well and he was very deft in his brushwork and it wasn't always about the content but also about the process that was very spiritual for him. He really inspired you. He, he really did. He, he was definitely my key inspiration for all of this. So talk me through, if you will, the process. Icons will always start life as, as a piece of wood generally because the paint that we use is the kind that might get a bit brittle and crack. And they're covered with canvas and then the surface we actually prepare them with looks a bit like a milkshake but really it's chalk powder mixed with um, some kind of glue. And then on top of that we would uh, then apply the drawing most usually in charcoal, just because it's very easy to rub away if you're not very happy with the design. And once you're happy with the design, finally, you take a paint, you would paint over the charcoal so it sets it there. And the gold leaf is a very important part. It is, it is. It's supposed to symbolise the glory of God shining around the saints or shining from within the saints in the halos. How much does your faith play a part in each and every one that you produce? And it wouldn't mean a thing if, if, if it wasn't about if it wasn't about Christ. I look back on some of the icons that I've managed to do and every time it, it, it convinces me more and more that God has a hand in all this. I, just, I, can't, I can't even replicate some of the things I used to do and I think, I think God was really saving my bacon every now and again. He said, you know, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna paint this one for you just in case you mess this up. What do they actually mean? What, what, what's their purpose? Through icons, you know, we're trying to encourage different sight. Of course, we as humans don't walk around with halos, but if we saw somehow with our spiritual eyes, if we saw as Christ saw us, we'd always see the Holy Spirit burning through from within us, you know, literally burning with light outside uh, our bodies and filling us with light. You'll also see the faces, generally speaking, are, are quite um, similar. Uh, and some people say, you know, doesn't that mean you're just copying face to face to face? But you can take it from a different point of view and think, well, if Christ is akin to the Father, or if he and the Father are one, then of course we are his children. And so to some extent, we will look like him, spiritually speaking. What is it you hope that worshippers today get from these beautiful pieces? Icons, in fact, are often said to be windows to heaven. We never claim that they are heaven themselves, but they are a looking glass through which we're reminded of our perfect imaginings of Christ, who he really is in the spiritual eye, rather than with the human eye. But they're just reminders that we're not alone in their, in their spiritual journey with Christ. And now, celebrating the different strands of the Orthodox family, here is the Georgian Orthodox singer Katie Melua in the Greek Orthodox Cathedral in London.
Katie Mellew are there with another example of the great variety in Christian worship. When sisters Laura and Sarah Ayub put one of their performances online in 2017, little did they know it would catapult them to fame. Months later, their debut album was number one in the classical charts. Laura Wright went to meet them to talk about music, inspiration, and growing up in Glasgow in a Coptic Christian family. Thank you so much for being here today and we're obviously in this beautiful Coptic Orthodox Church which for me is a totally new experience but for you must feel quite a familiar setting. Absolutely. We grew up um, in Coptic churches in Glasgow and then when we moved to London um, we've been around a couple of the different Coptic churches here but the environment is special and it's difficult to find such a kind of peaceful and reflective atmosphere anywhere else. And was that sort of church community for you growing up in Glasgow important? Yeah, it was. I mean, in Glasgow, there was a very small community of Copts. I think there was like five or six families. And um, we didn't actually have a church there. We would hire um, the Union Chapel and we would meet once a month. And it was a, a great place to kind of meet other people from a similar background. I think from a young age, our parents did a great job of actually taking us to see live concerts right from when we were babies, literally, which I think made a huge difference because we could always kind of envisage what it could look like because we saw performers on a stage doing a concert. So can you tell us what is so special about the worship in a Coptic Orthodox church? The majority of it is actually sung but not only that, it's sung in, in quarter tones, which... Quarter tones? You have a C, and then you have a C sharp. It's somewhere in the middle. So it's in between a white and a black note? Yes. So obviously you can't play quarter tones on a piano, um, but if you are playing a string instrument or if you're using your voice, you have to find these in between places. Wow. Which is really difficult to do. That Coptic tradition, has that influenced your music going forwards? Absolutely. We would hear these melodies every time we'd go to church and only recently, about two years ago, we transcribed a section from that Coptic liturgy and rearranged it in a kind of classical style and we composed a piece called Call to Prayers inspired by that Coptic liturgy. At that moment when you're performing, perhaps especially back home, is that where you feel perhaps closer to God? It is a very spiritual experience playing for any people, um, feeling that kind of atmosphere in the room, feeling the atmosphere between the two of us. It's difficult to describe, um, but it's, it can be very, very spiritual and uplifting. So you're going to be performing for us as well today, so can you tell us a little bit about what you're going to be performing? Recently we discovered this hymn um, which turns out to be a traditional melody um, that was kind of brought to light. It's called Yamari Milbik, which translated as Ave Maria and it's really a beautiful melody and really heavily ornamented and we'll be arranging it for cello and violin.
The Coptic Orthodox Church may be steeped in history, but it still strives to meet the challenges of the modern world. In the year 2000, young people in the church set up Coptic City Mission, a project helping the homeless in central London. One of the principles of Coptic City Mission is that it's not just about the food, it's more about the fellowship, it's more about giving them some company. It's very important that the young people get involved because I feel it creates more of a community, they become friends, they serve alongside each other and they become more outwardly focused. I like to do this because knowing that some people can't go home with a roof over their head and sleep in a bed, just helping out makes a big difference. The group has been present here every week without fail over the past 20 years, and this consistency has helped to build long-term relationships. Mark is one of the regulars. When I first come to Victoria, I found this church, such a good church, as in not paying lip service to Christianity. I started doing artwork when I came to London. Before that, I had no idea I could be an artist. And once I had the idea I could do this, it was the Egyptians who bought me all my pens, everything I needed. The Egyptians always had it for me. Mark is now working towards an exhibition of his artwork. In the Coptic Church, they've always taught me to be like active in my faith. We like to follow the message of Christ and to follow what he did and just, he's our example. The Coptic Orthodox Church puts a lot of pressure on the fact that we are one family here on the earth. That's plain and simple. And that's the main message of Christianity, that we're all sons and daughters of God. And so we do this to look after our family. At the end of the day, everything that we're given is not ours. We're merely just stewards of it. And so what, what's the point of having it if you're not going to share it with the rest of your family? Kind of different expressions of Christian faith can really enrich our own experience of God. And I have to say, I've really enjoyed being here today, learning more about the rich traditions of the Coptic Orthodox Church.